Well, Mason, I think it's time we read some more stories. Close the door so it's quiet in here. Today I found the book Town Mouse and Country Mouse and Other Tales, illustrated by Jane Harvey. So this book has got a lot of different stories in it. Oop, there's a little mouse with a... Looks like he's writing this story. Town Mouse and Country Mouse and Other Tales. Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, The Emperor's New Clothes, The Princess and the Pea, Tom Tit Tot, The Ugly Duckling, Chanticleer and Partlet. Oh, these are lots of... Lots of nice stories. Let's start out with Town Mouse and Country Mouse. <clears throat> okay. Once upon a time, there were two cousins, a town mouse and a country mouse. The country mouse lived in a hole directly beneath a grassy bank. In one corner of her little hole stood her bed, made from crumpled up newspaper and twigs. In another corner lay her hoard of nuts and odd bits and pieces. Well, one day Country Mouse was delighted to receive a visit from her cousin, the Town Mouse. But Town Mouse was rather grumpy after her long trek and squeaked indignantly at her cousin. Do you really live in a dark little hole? Can this be your real home? Well, Country Mouse was most upset. It's all my own, she replied. I've got everything I need here. It's only fit for beetles and ants, muttered Town Mouse as she surveyed the little hole. You've got no idea what it's like in my house. Fine rooms, corridors to race down, each day a feast of crumbs under the dining room table. Well, my food is delicious, too, interrupted Country Mouse as she scuttled away to her larder. Dear cousin, take a nibble at this fine apple core, or perhaps you would prefer to gnaw at one of my rinds of cheese. Rind, did you say? In my house there's a larder as big as your mouse hole piled high with cheeses. Whole ones, holy ones, soft ones, hard ones, smelly ones. You've simply no idea. I'll just munch a few of your nuts, said Town Mouse. Then she turned to Country Mouse. Now listen, I simply cannot stay here a moment longer. You must accompany me, dear cousin, to my house, and you'll soon see how we mice really live. And off they set through the fields and lanes, and came at last to the town. Ordinary houses, muttered Town Mouse as they scurried along. Wait until you see my house. A short time later they came to a grand house, and Town Mouse led the way under the door, through the hall, and along the passage. Finally they reached the larder. That's like a pantry. Country Mouse's whiskers were quivering and twitching with excitement as she spied first a great smoked ham, and then piles of apples and giant cheeses. Country Mouse scuttled toward the cheese as Town Mouse squeaked. Keep away! There's a trap that'll snap you in two. Scramble up on the shelf. It's safe up here. Well, suddenly the door opened. Quick, hide, it's the cook, whispered Town Mouse, and the two mice scurried behind a great jar of pickles. Mice, muttered the cook. Puss, puss, he shouted through the open door. Catch those horrors at once, or there will be no supper for you. The door slammed shut, and the great ginger Tom leapt onto a shelf. The two mice dived onto the floor to escape and as the cat jumped down, he could see Town Mouse's tail disappearing into a hole in the wainscot. But poor Country Mouse was not so lucky, 
She panicked and slithered this way and that, and the cat pounced on her, let her go, and pounced again. He drove her right up to the open hole, but as he lifted his paw, Country Mouse darted into the hole, safe at last. A few minutes later she peeped out, saw the ginger Tom lapping up his saucer of milk, and she bolted for the door. She squeezed under it and ran all the way home. She looked around her cozy little hole before snuggling down contentedly on her bed of newspaper and twigs. Ah, ah, how much better was her own simple home than all the luxuries of town life. <laughs> yeah, that's a good story. Well, let's read another one. Let's read another one. That one wasn't quite so long. Let's see if we can find another one. Aladdin is kind of a long story. The Little Mermaid is kind of a long story. We can read those another time. Oh, how about The Emperor's New Clothes? Once upon a time there lived an emperor who cared about nothing but his splendid clothes. He had a wardrobe as big as a ballroom, and there he spent all his spare time. He rarely left his wardrobe except to show off his clothes. The emperor's wardrobe was famous all over the world, and tailors were always sure of finding a job at the palace. It was considered a great honor to add to his magnificent wardrobe. One day, however, two swindlers came to the emperor. Now, swindlers are cheaters. Came to the emperor as he was trying on a new suit with purple zigzags. Well, these swindlers announced that they were weavers and asked the emperor if he desired to see proof of their skill. Apparently, <clears throat> they could weave the world's most beautiful clothes with astounding colors and marvelous shifting patterns. Not only that, but a suit of clothes made from their cloth would seem invisible to anyone who is dull or unfit for high office. Well, the emperor was dumbfounded at the thought of acquiring clothes that could also become invisible. Imagine, with splendid garments like that, I could easily discover which of my counselors are worthy of their office. The two swindlers were set to work at once, and the emperor left orders that they should be given as many fine materials as they wished, and what materials they demanded. The finest silks and velvets in every color of the rainbow along with enough, with enough gold and silver thread to sew 100 suits. All of these materials the swindlers bundled into their own bags while they worked away at the empty looms. The emperor insisted that no one should disturb the weavers until they had finished, but finally he grew impatient and sent his wisest minister to inspect the room. As the minister entered the room, he saw the swindlers working hard at their wounds. But as far as he could see, the looms were empty. Do come closer, invited one of the swindlers. Have you come to see how we're getting on? <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, stammered the poor minister. The emperor himself has sent me. Well, on hearing this, both swindlers eagerly begged him to give them his honest opinion on the material they were weaving. The minister stared and stared at the loom, but he still could see nothing. Why, I must be unfit for my royal office, he thought, must, much astonished. I must never, ever let the emperor know, or he will dispense with my services and banish me to the country. So the minister smiled at the swindlers and assured them that the material was all that could be desired. 
and then he hurried off to inform the emperor that the fabulous new suit of clothing was coming. On a treat, a few days later, the emperor again became anxious to see how his clothes were getting on. And this time he sent one of his most faithful chancellors. My goodness gracious me, muttered the chancellor to himself as he entered the room. These looms are bare. He peered through his spectacles at the empty looms, and he rushed out of the room and ran straight to the emperor to praise the material. Your majesty must make these wonderful men royal weavers, he declared. At this, the emperor became so curious that he decided to inspect the weavers himself. So he accompanied so, accompanied by several court officials, he marched through the palace until he reached the weaver's room. He strode forward, impatient to see his new clothes. But the emperor himself could not see anything on the looms. Oh, this is tragic, he moaned to himself. What shall I do? If I admit in front of all my officials that I can see nothing... I will be the laughing stock of my kingdom. Oh, how unfair life is! And the emperor almost burst into tears in his distress. But then he thought that nobody would know how unfit he was to be emperor if he let them think that he really could see the clothes. Breathtaking! Astounding! Magnificent! he cried out. Such originality! How do you feel about them, my friends? He asked his silent officials. Exquisite, murmured one of the chancellors. Everyone looked at the looms, but not a single person was brave enough to admit that he could see no cloth. I shall wear these clothes in the great procession next week, announced the emperor grandly. All my people will be overjoyed to see me wearing them at last. They're the talk of the kingdom. So that week the swindlers sat up late every night, pretending to complete the clothes. All day they cut and sewed, snipping at thin air and sewing with threadless needles. Every visitor heaped praise on the work of the swindlers. And at last the day of the procession arrived. The sun was shining brightly, and at six o'clock in the morning the streets were already lined with impatient people. The emperor hurried to the swindlers and asked if the new clothes were ready. Why, yes, indeed, your majesty, replied the swindlers. They are here, waiting for you to put them on. Well, uh, yes, um, or thank you, stuttered the emperor, still hardly able to believe that the clothes were invisible to him. They're more beautiful than ever. Then the emperor took off his pink satin nightgown, and the swindlers pretended to help him on with the new clothes. An old counselor stood by shaking his head in mock amazement and marveling at the perfect fit. Soon everybody in the room was following his example, shaking their heads like dodos and clucking in astonishment. At last the emperor was ready. He turned round and round several times in front of the mirror to give the appearance of admiring the clothes. And then the emperor's most honored officials pretended to pick up his train. The train is the clothing that follows flows on the ground behind. Crowds were shouting for the emperor, and all the people were craning their necks and standing on tiptoe in an effort to be the first to see the famous clothes. The emperor strode into view, and suddenly, after a moment of silence, everyone began cheering and praising the weavers who were also in the procession. 
all the people started to admire the non-existent clothes at the top of their voices, for they did not want to look like fools. But one little girl, bored by hear, hearing her parents go on and on about the magnificence of the colors and the delicacy of the cloth, said loudly, "'But he hasn't got anything on!' "'What did you say? "'He hasn't got anything on? "'Why, you silly little girl, "'of course our emperor has got something on,' gasped her father. "'Shh!' hissed the girl's mother. "'The neighbors might hear.' "'But the neighbors had heard, "'and gradually the girl's words were whispered among the crowd, "'until everyone had heard them.' Finally, all the people cried out together, But the emperor hasn't got anything on. And the emperor heard them clearly and realized how he had been tricked. Furiously, he turned on the swindlers, but they had slipped away. Ah, there is nothing for it, he thought miserably. I will simply have to go through with the procession now. So the emperor marched on more upright than ever, and the official continued to hold up the invisible train as he walked through town with naked as a jaybird. <laughs> That's pretty funny. There's a lesson to be learned in that story. I'm not quite sure what it is. Maybe your mom and dad will figure it out. Ah! Now. Yeah.